Back in the summer of 2012, my daughter and I toured a pre-Civil War plantation home that was only a couple of miles from where we lived in Rome, Georgia at the time. Records from the 1830s show Major Ridge, original builder and owner of this home and plantation, was quite prosperous. Ridge had first built a log cabin here in 1820 for his family. As he prospered, he eventually did renovations to turn the shell of the cabin into the foundation for a proper southern plantation house. He owned a prosperous ferry business taking area folks across the wide nearby river. Right down the road from the mansion to this day is a popular area known as Ridge Ferry Park. Major Ridge got his title in 1814 fighting under Andrew Jackson in the Creek War. General Jackson awarded Ridge for his bravery at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend with the rank of Major. As a prosperous plantation owner, Major Ridge had high aspirations for his only son John and sent him at age 17 to a seminary in Connecticut where he studied astronomy, calculus, theology, geography, chemistry, navigation, surveying, French, Greek, and Latin, along with practical courses such as blacksmithing. Yes, in the mid-1830s, Major Ridge had all the trappings of the life of a prosperous southern gentleman, just like Gerald O'Hara of Terra in Gone with the Wind, including the stylish clothes of the time. In the 1830s, it was typical for many fashionable men to wear a dark coat, light vest, white shirt with a tall collar, and a dark cravat for day wear, just like Congressman Davy Crockett of Tennessee in this picture. Major Ridge eventually had opportunities himself to mingle with famous men in Washington, and as you can see by this portrait of him from the 1830s, he was right in style for such events, with his dark coat, dark cravat, light vest, and white shirt with a tall, very tall collar. There's just one teensy thing I haven't told you yet. You might not guess it just by looking at his portrait unless you have a keen eye for such things. But no one had to guess it back in the 1830s. Even with Major Ridge's stylish coat and very tall collar and dark cravat, they knew right away Major Ridge was a Cherokee Indian. Major Ridge wasn't just a Cherokee, he was a Cherokee chief one of three Georgia men often referred to as the Cherokee Triumvirate in their younger years in the early 1800s. His plantation home is now host to the Chieftain's Museum, dedicated to preserving Cherokee and Native American history. His real name in the Cherokee language meant the man who walks on the mountaintop. This was simplified to his English name, The Ridge, Major Ridge, once he'd gotten his promotion from Andrew Jackson. And therein lies a tale you might say is about the most famous Native American I'll bet you never heard of. When the British arrived in America, the Cherokee were one of the main tribes occupying the areas that are now Georgia, the Carolinas, and eastern Tennessee. Traders and government agents who dealt with these Cherokee were nearly all from Scotland, and many of them married Cherokee women. Major Ridge's father was believed to have been a full-blooded Cherokee, but his mother was Scots. The other two Cherokee leaders in the triumvirate, James Van and Charles Hicks, each had a Scots fur trader father and a mixed race mother. In Cherokee culture, the system of property and hereditary leadership was matrilineal, descending through the women. So these three men were brought up in the clans of their mothers, in Cherokee surroundings, and their primary male influences would have been their Cherokee uncles. But as we've seen from his plantation, Major Ridge eventually became acculturated to Anglo-European ways, and he wasn't the only one. Hicks and his wife became Christians in 1813. He was extremely well-read and had collected one of the largest personal libraries in North America at the time. And Ridge wasn't the only one with the mansion, plantation, ferry, and trading post. Van became the richest man in the Cherokee Nation and possibly in the entire eastern U.S. at the time. He built his Diamond Hill Mansion near present-day Chatsworth, Georgia. He also ran a ferry service across a nearby river and built a tavern and store nearby to supply locals and travelers. He also owned another ferry service which crossed the Chattahoochee River near present-day Atlanta and later a trading post near present-day Huntsville, Alabama. Van had more than a hundred slaves and hundreds of acres of plantation and more land in Tennessee. And then there was Principal Chief John Ross, the most influential Cherokee leader by the mid-1830s. 
Ross had a 170-acre tobacco plantation in Tennessee, worked by 20 slaves, along with a trading firm and a warehouse pulling in big profits. In 1816, he founded Ross's Landing on the site, which is now Chattanooga, Tennessee. Another influential Cherokee was Sequoia, the Cherokee name of George Guess. He created a complete writing system for the Cherokee language, the first and only time in history that a member of a non-literate people independently created an effective writing system. It was adopted by the Cherokee in 1825 and was received so enthusiastically by the Cherokees that their illiteracy rate quickly surpassed that of surrounding European American settlers. By 1828, Sequoia was publishing the Cherokee Phoenix newspaper with text in Cherokee and English. Yes, by the 1820s, the Cherokee nation in general was on its way to being more and more like the white settlers. The Georgic Cherokee nation discarded the traditional clan system and instead adopted a government similar to the U.S. with the two-level equivalent of the U.S. Congress. Delegates from eight districts made laws and approved treaties. In 1819, they established a capital for the new Cherokee nation at New Echota, a planned community laid out by Cherokee surveyors. It had broad streets, a council house, supreme courthouse and printing office, private homes and stores. A historic center on the original site now features original and reconstructed buildings from that era. Some years before, in December 1808, Thomas Jefferson had held a special meeting with the chiefs of several Indian tribes, including the Mohicans. On the occasion of such meetings, a U.S. president customarily distributed to tribal chiefs silver presidential Indian peace medals. This practice continued until 1893. At the meeting in December 1808, Jefferson assured the chiefs in attendance of this. You will unite yourselves with us, join our great councils, and form one people with us, and we shall all be Americans. You will mix with us by marriage. Your blood will run within our veins and will spread with us over this great continent. Earlier in May that same year, he had held a similar meeting with the chiefs of the Cherokees, at which he had said, I shall rejoice to see the day when the red men, our neighbors, become truly one people with us, enjoying all the rights and privileges we do, and living in peace and plenty as we do, without anyone to make them afraid, to injure their persons, or to take their property without being punished for it according to fixed laws. In his various speeches to and about the tribes of his time, Jefferson made it clear that all any of the Indian tribes had to do was go along with the civilization program that the American government sponsored to earn the rights Jefferson spoke about. And the Cherokee people of Georgia had been taking these promises to heart. More and more of them were adapting to an agrarian lifestyle like their Anglo-American neighbors. By the early 1830s, some among them had made great strides in living up to the standards of civilized living. You might say they were beginning to live the American dream. Unfortunately, back in 1808, Jefferson had neglected to tell the Cherokee chiefs of a secret document called the Compact of 1802 he had signed in agreement with the state government of Georgia. Under that agreement, Georgia agreed to give up any claims to the lands to the west of Georgia that later became Alabama and Mississippi. In exchange, the U.S. government, totally contrary to treaties it had made with the Cherokee, granted to Georgia the future right to the Cherokee lands within Georgia. The U.S. government promised to eventually expel the Indians from that land, sending them beyond the Mississippi, and to turn over to the state of Georgia all that property to use as it saw fit. This was expected to take about 40 years to accomplish. Jefferson initially indicated he expected this removal of the Indians to be able to be done peaceably and on reasonable terms by paying the Indians for the land. 
Evidently, Mr. Jefferson had a number of ideas of just how this peaceable goal could be attained. He outlined one in a secret letter in 1803 to William Henry Harrison, who was governor of the Indiana Territory at the time. In it, Jefferson literally suggested that the U.S. government encourage Indian nations to purchase goods on credit from the government at trading posts. He wrote that this would likely cause them to fall into monetary debt, which they could eliminate by selling their lands to the government. As for Anglo and Indian blood mixing, Major Ridge's son John Ridge and other Cherokees very quickly found out that the average American hadn't the slightest interest in following Jefferson's blood mixing ideas. Remember the rigorous school in Connecticut where John studied? It was the Foreign Mission School established in 1817 to prepare non-Caucasian young men to be missionaries to their own people. Students came from a variety of backgrounds including Chinese, Hawaiians, Hindu, Choctaw, and Cherokee. The devout Christian Anglo-Americans who lived near the school had been happy to donate to help build the school and support its programs. But when some of the local young women became interested in the young non-Caucasian men in attendance, those devout Christians became enraged. John Ridge married one of the local girls and was immediately condemned. John's cousin, Elias Boudinot, who was also a Georgia Cherokee, became engaged to another local girl, and her family and other area residents became so enraged that they publicly burned the couple in effigy. Look at these young men. Neither matched the standard conception of some sort of hideous heathen savage. Elias had converted to Christianity in 1820, six years before his marriage. In 1824, he was part of a team that translated and published the New Testament in Cherokee. Yes, both John Ridge and Elias Boudinot and many other Cherokee were capable of much more than beating a tom-tom and making wigwams. They had been admonished by Thomas Jefferson, one of the greatest of the U.S. founding fathers, to aspire to civilization, and they were making great progress toward that goal. But back in Georgia Cherokee territory, their civilized Cherokee plantations and towns and businesses and schools were sitting on land that the white citizens of Georgia felt rightly belonged to Georgia because of the Compact of 1802. Those Georgians had tried to be patient about waiting for the U.S. to remove the Indians who were on that land. But then came the game changer. Gold was discovered in Cherokee Territory in North Georgia in 1828. A Georgia gold rush, similar to later events in California and Alaska, followed, and Major Ridge and his well-dressed, civilized, literate compatriots soon found out firsthand that they were indeed going to spread all over the great continent with the Americans, but not quite in the way they had expected. U.S. President Andrew Jackson, the very man who had given Major Ridge his name, was ready and willing to speed up the time of Jefferson's secret agreement with Georgia. Jackson had campaigned for the presidency in 1828 on a platform that included adamantly advocating the removal of all Indians, including the Cherokee, from their homelands in the east to a federal Indian territory west of the Mississippi. In 1830, his efforts succeeded when the U.S. Congress passed the Indian Removal Act. The removal was, in theory, supposed to be voluntary. But in practice, great pressure was put on Native American leaders to sign removal treaties. The act was highly controversial. There was widespread acceptance of it by the man on the street, but there was some outspoken opposition by some influential Americans. Many Christian missionaries protested against it. Future U.S. President Abraham Lincoln opposed it, and Congressman Davy Crockett of Tennessee spoke out against it, but it was still passed. Cherokee leaders such as Major Ridge and John Ross began to panic. As a direct result of the gold rush, on December 20, 1828, Georgia enacted a series of laws which stripped the Cherokees of their rights, suppressed their government, and regulated activities on their lands, hoping to force the Cherokee to move. John Ross led a delegation to Washington to attempt to plead the Cherokees' case. 
Rebuffed by Jackson, in 1831 they took two cases to the U.S. Supreme Court. They lost the first case, but the second was resolved in their favor by the court, with Georgia ordered to stop trying to enforce its laws on the Cherokee. But Georgia refused to pay any attention to the court, and President Jackson refused to enforce the court's ruling. And then, Georgia gleefully put in place its infamous 1832 land lottery. All of the territory currently belonging to the Cherokee was divided up into plots, and a lottery was set up whereby each of those plots would be awarded by lot to white Georgia citizens. Each qualified white person was entitled to at least one chance, two if they were in a special group such as veterans, orphans, or heads of families. The lottery was held at the state capitol at Milledgeville. Tickets with names were placed in a rotating drum. Tickets with plot numbers were placed in another. After spinning the drums, a ticket was drawn from each. By paying a small fee, the person whose name was drawn from the first drum became the owner of the plot drawn from the second drum. Because gold had been discovered in part of the Cherokee Territory in 1828, the lottery drew even more excitement. There was always the chance you might win land that had an actual gold mine. Or you might win a plot featuring a prosperous plantation or estate like those of Ridge, Ross, and Van. A popular song of the day summed up the general attitude. All I want in this creation is a pretty little wife and a big plantation, away up yonder in the Cherokee Nation. The winners in the lottery were not able to move on to their property until the current resident Cherokee people were removed. But given the developments in Washington, everyone knew that would be soon. The Cherokee's great American dream was about to become the great American nightmare. By spring 1833, the Cherokee had become solidly divided into two groups, each with a different plan on how to deal with the threat of removal. Chief John Ross was the head of the National Party that at first hoped to stand firm and in unity with hopes that justice would prevail and their allies in the U.S. government, such as Davy Crockett, would be able to turn the tide in their favor, allowing them to stay in their ancestral lands. The vast majority of the Cherokee supported this National Party. Major Ridge became convinced that the Cherokee would all be destroyed if they tried to fight the removal. He and John, leaders of the Treaty Party, began trying to convince their people to sign a treaty giving up all their lands in exchange for the promise of land in the Indian Territory and a lump sum payment by the government to help with the resettling. In 1835, Ross went to Washington to try to persuade federal leaders to take the Cherokee's side in the problems with Georgia. At the same time, the Treaty Party sent John Ridge to try to broker a deal providing for voluntary removal of the Cherokee to the Indian Territory. Ross kept stalling, trying to buy time, hoping against hope that Jackson or the Congress would relent. But the Ridge Treaty Party accepted a treaty offer that would give the Cherokee $5 million in exchange for all the land and would commit the Cherokee to leaving for Indian Territory. The offer was put to a Cherokee council vote in October 1835 and was rejected soundly, with only 114 voting for it out of thousands in attendance at the council gathering. But Jackson had lost patience and sent U.S. agent J.F. Shemerhorn to get a treaty signed, no matter what. The agent called for a meeting of the Cherokee council for December 28, 1835 in the abandoned New Echota capital the National Party refused to attend. So the U.S. agent gathered a small group of men from the Treaty Party, including Major Ridge, John Ridge, and Elias Boudinot at Boudinot's home in New Echota on December 29th. There, he had them sign the treaty anyway and called it a day. As Major Ridge signed his name, he is reported to have commented, I have signed my death warrant. He was serious. He had been part of a much earlier decision by the Cherokee people that any tribal member who agreed to sell Cherokee land was to be put to death. 
The treaty provided for a grace period of two years from the time of its ratification by the U.S. Congress, during which the Cherokee could remove themselves voluntarily to Oklahoma. After that, they would be removed involuntarily. That set the deadline for May 1838. The Ross National Party was furious. Those signing the treaty were not the elected leadership of the Cherokee at all. John Ross gathered signatures of over 13,000 Cherokee on a petition which was sent to Washington in February 1836, entreating the U.S. government to recognize that the Treaty of New Echota was totally invalid. The petition written by Ross said in part that the results of this invalid treaty were that we are stripped of every attribute of freedom and eligibility for legal self-defense. Our property may be plundered before our eyes. Violence may be committed on our persons. Even our lives may be taken away and there is none to regard our complaints. We are denationalized. We are disfranchised. We are deprived of membership in the human family. We have neither land nor home nor resting place that can be called our own. Ross begged the U.S. government to reconsider. But Jackson was not impressed with the petition and ignored it totally. And the Senate ratified a slightly modified version of the treaty on May 23rd by a single vote. Jackson, of course, promptly signed it into law. For obviously, the reality was that the finer points of treaties were irrelevant. In an interview with Playboy magazine in May 1971, Hollywood actor John Wayne expressed what was relevant in dealing with the Indians. I don't feel we did wrong in taking this great country away from them, if that's what you're asking. Our so-called stealing of this country from them was just a matter of survival. There were great numbers of people who needed new land, and the Indians were selfishly trying to keep it for themselves. Yes, in Wayne's upside-down world, Major Ridge, John Ross, and all the other Cherokee who had bought into the American dream, who had played the game according to the rules, had become civilized and anglicized, had worked hard to create a legacy for their own children by establishing plantations and businesses and so on, were just selfish. Those citizens of Georgia who wanted their plantations and gold and whatever other goodies were available on their land were just trying to survive. Major Ridge and his family, and many others of the treaty party, did pack up their belongings in 1837 and move to the Oklahoma Territory. But John Ross still would not give in. He was sure he could go to Washington and hammer out a new deal for the Cherokee to stay, or at least get a better deal for the new land in Oklahoma. Ross was wrong. And that brings us to the sleepy little town of Cedartown, Georgia, where I happened to live for a year after moving there from Rome, Georgia, a town that today makes its only real claim to fame the fact that it is the birthplace of Sterling Holloway, the popular character actor who was the voice of Disney's Winnie the Pooh. You have to dig deep to find out Cedartown's darker claim to fame. For you see, when the majority of the Cherokee held out hope of a change of heart of the U.S. government, and didn't follow the treaty party to Oklahoma, they set themselves up on a path that led, in 1838, to the Trail of Tears. And the southernmost point of that infamous trail, what is, in one way, the beginning of the Trail of Tears, was located just three-tenths of a mile around the corner and down the street from that historical sign honoring Sterling Holloway. Well, it began there, but its roots were actually in Washington, D.C. Andrew Jackson had been elected as president in 1828. His second annual message was delivered on December 6, 1830 to the U.S. Congress. His speech included these cheery excerpts. It gives me pleasure to announce to Congress that the benevolent policy of the government, steadily pursued for nearly 30 years in relation to the removal of the Indians beyond the white settlements, is approaching to a happy consummation. 
What good man would prefer a country covered with forests and ranged by a few thousand savages to our extensive republic, studded with cities, towns, and prosperous farms, occupied by more than 12 million happy people, and filled with all the blessings of liberty, civilization, and religion? Happy, happy, happy. Yes, Jackson's glowing announcement almost sounds like a 19th century version of the popular hit by Bobby McFerrin a few years back. Don't worry. Be happy. But by 1837, it was obvious that his characterization of happy consummation was a cruel hoax, and the Cherokee, indeed, needed to worry. Most Cherokee people seemed to be holding out hope that a new president in the White House might change their fortunes. But after Jackson's vice president, Martin Van Buren, was voted in as the next president in the 1836 election, it became painfully obvious that he had no intention of making any changes in the plans set in motion by Jackson. At the end of December 1837, the government warned the Cherokee that the clause in the Treaty of New Echota requiring that they should removed to their new homes within two years from the ratification of the treaty, would be enforced. Still, they held out hope for a reprieve. For after all, weren't there signs all over the country that many U.S. citizens were deeply opposed to the Indian removal plans and were speaking out in their defense? One of the most eloquent of such efforts was a long, passionate letter written to Van Buren by the 35-year-old Ralph Waldo Emerson in April 1838 begging him to reconsider the removal plans. It was published as an open letter in newspapers around the country, including the Burlington, Vermont Free Press. Regarding the New Echota Treaty, Emerson wrote, Almost the entire Cherokee nation stand up and say, This is not our act. Behold us, here are we. Do not mistake that handful of deserters for us. And the American President and the Cabinet, the Senate and the House of Representatives, neither hear these men nor see them, and are contracting to put this active nation into carts and boats, and to drag them over mountains and rivers to a wilderness at a vast distance beyond the Mississippi. A paper purporting to be an army order fixes a month from this day as the hour for this doleful removal. In the name of God, sir, we ask you if this be so. Do the newspapers rightly inform us? Men and women with pale and perplexed faces meet one another in the streets and churches here and ask if this be so. Such a dereliction of all faith and virtue, such a denial of justice and such deafness to screams for mercy were never heard of in times of peace and in the dealing of a nation with its own allies and wards since the earth was made. Van Buren was no more impressed with this letter than Jackson was with John Ross's letter begging him not to recognize the new Echota Treaty. In May, President Van Buren sent General Winfield Scott to get the job done. On May 10, 1838, General Scott issued the following proclamation. Cherokees, the President of the United States has sent me with a powerful army to cause you, in obedience to the Treaty of 1835, to join that part of your people who are already established in prosperity on the other side of the Mississippi. The full moon of May is already on the wane, and before another shall have passed, every Cherokee man, woman, and child must be in motion to join their brethren in the far west. When the Cherokee did not heed this warning and pack up and head out voluntarily, Scott issued the order to his troops to begin their involuntary removal. Armed soldiers began rounding up the Cherokee and removing them to military stockades that had been set up for the purpose in and near the area of the Cherokee Nation lands. Thirty-one forts were constructed for this purpose. All of the posts were near Cherokee towns and they served only as temporary housing for the Cherokees. As soon as practical, the Indians were transferred from the removal forts to ten larger internment camps. Yes concentration camps that were more centrally located. By late July 1838, almost all Cherokee people remaining in the East were in the internment camps. 
Here's how one eyewitness described conditions of the roundup in June. The Cherokees are nearly all prisoners. They have been dragged from their houses and encamped at the forts and military posts all over the Cherokee Nation. In Georgia especially, multitudes were allowed no time to take anything with them except the clothes they had on. Well-furnished houses were left prey to plunderers, who, like hungry wolves, follow in the trail of the captors. These wretches rifle the houses and strip the helpless, unoffending owners of all they have on earth. An anthropologist years later reconstructed some of the horrific events from other eyewitness accounts. Families at dinner were startled by the sudden gleam of bayonets in the doorway and rose up to be driven with blows and oaths along the weary miles of travel leading to the stockades. Men were seized in the fields all along the roads. Women were taken from their spinning wheels and children from their play. In many cases, as they turned for one last look as they crossed the ridge, they saw their homes in flames, fired by the lawless rabble that followed on the heels of the soldiers to loot and to pillage. So keen were these outlaws on the scent that in some instances they were driving off the cattle and other stock of the Indians almost before the soldiers had started their owners in the other direction. Systematic hunts were made by the same men for Indian graves to rob them of the silver pendants and other valuables deposited with the dead. An article on the removal forts on the NorthGeorgia.com website adds more to the details of the events. Conditions at the forts were horrible. Food intended for the tribe was sold to locals. What little the Cherokee had brought with them was stolen and sold. Living areas were filled with excrement. Birth rates among the Cherokee dropped to near zero during the months of captivity. Cherokee women and children were repeatedly raped. Soldiers forced their captives to perform acts of depravity so disgusting they cannot be told here. One member of the guard would later write, During the Civil War, I watched as hundreds of men died, including my own brother. But none of that compares to what we did to the Cherokee Indians. The stockades had no shelters inside to protect the Cherokees from the elements. Cooking implements were not provided, so rations, such as salt pork, had to be eaten raw. Some of the most pitiful accounts of the whole Trail of Tears experience were recorded in a daily journal by Daniel Buttrick, a missionary to the Cherokee who decided to travel with his parishioners in their tragedy. Here are just a handful of excerpts from May until September 1838 regarding their capture and confinement before the actual journey west began. A man, deaf and dumb, being surprised at the approach of armed men, attempted to make his escape and because he did not hear and obey the command of his pursuers, was shot dead on the spot. Women, absent from their families on visits or for other purposes, were seized, and men, far from their wives and children, were not allowed to return, and also children being forced from home were dragged off among strangers. They were not allowed to stop or rest on account of sickness. They were driven on as long as they could walk and then thrown into wagons. When some were perceived to be in the agonies of death, the wagon master ordered them to drive on. When it was known that one was dead, the lifeless body was left to the care of some stranger. We also learned that when the last company was taken over the river at Ross's Landing, a woman, in the pains of childbirth, stood and walked as long as possible and then fell on the bank of the river. A soldier coming up stabbed her with his bayonet, which, together with other pains, soon caused her death. And where did my former hometown of Cedartown fit in all this? The land where Cedartown now sits was originally in the middle of the Cherokee Nation and inhabited by Cherokee families. White Georgia citizens who had won Cherokee property in the 1832 land lottery were waiting for the Cherokee to be removed so they could take possession of their winnings. In 1838, under Jackson's orders, a temporary Cherokee removal fort was set up by military volunteers on a plot taken up now by the city's Big Spring Park. Nearly 300 Cherokee people were herded into this fort and held for weeks in horrible and squalid conditions. 
half starved and mistreated by their captors, disease was rampant. Many of the old and young died before the 200 or so left alive were forcibly marched north to wait in a large internment camp in Tennessee before heading on down the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma. After their departure, the guard company tore down the camp and went back to their own homes, and before long, no traces remained of the roundup of Cherokees from their homes around Cedartown. Yes, no traces remained, either on the ground or evidently in the memory of the area residents. Here's a historical plaque that was installed at the spot, a few blocks from Sterling Holloway's birth home, remember, where the Cherokee internment camp had been, in what is now Big Spring Park in Cedartown, erected sometime after 1932. There is no mention in the inscription of the dark era of Cedartown history that occurred on the very spot. No, instead it reads, Peace-loving Cherokee gathered here. Indian young people danced their corn dance under the cedar trees. The tragedy of the Cherokee removal seems to have been known widely around the U.S. at the time, as witnessed by that letter from Ralph Waldo Emerson. But time and history have a way of marching on and leaving the horrific stories of the poor and downtrodden and dispossessed only a faded memory, if a memory at all. Oh, the grand and glorious stories of Civil War battles have never faded, of course. For instance, like Civil War memorials all over the South, the Chickamauga battleground in Tennessee, just miles from where the Cherokee were imprisoned by the thousands in the primary concentration camps prior to their removal, is loaded with grand and glorious statuary. Just this one park has over 700 monuments, markers, and tablets to make sure no one ever forgets the event that occurred there. But up until 1987, you had to search high and low in the U.S. just to find a single physical reminder of the Trail of Tears events. It was the American Indian movement of the 1970s that brought the story back to the attention of the authors of popular history. Out of the midst of civil disobedience and general agitation by Native Americans in that tumultuous time, a variety of books chronicling Native American history arose. It started with Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee in 1971, which covered the broad history of many tribes, focusing on the tribes of the West. It was eventually joined by books focusing on the Cherokee experience. In 1987, the U.S. Congress finally responded to this growing interest in the topic and established the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail under the auspices of the National Park Service. Extensive efforts were made to locate and verify the actual paths and roads that the Cherokee took on their forced trek to the Oklahoma Indian Territory. Areas of Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Illinois, Kentucky, Missouri, North Carolina, Oklahoma, and Tennessee are now peppered with the Trail of Tears official signs. And each of the states provides information and planning materials for those who would like to explore some or all of the portions of the trail. Actually, even though the majority of the Cherokee who were rounded up for the trek lived in Georgia, and the Georgia government of the 1830s was the primary agent behind the scenes pushing the U.S. government for the removal, it was 2011 before any official recognition came that the first portions of the Trail of Tears started at the removal forts and camps in Georgia. The sign at the park in Cedartown in remembrance of the happy corn dances of the Cherokee has finally been joined in the same park by an official Trail of Tears sign that reads, in part, the land where you now stand plays a significant role in the Trail of Tears. On this ground, the Cherokee people wept, mourning the loss of the land they loved and the lives lost along this trail paved with tears. Once the Cherokee were rounded up into the removal forts 
and hustled on their way to the embarkation concentration camps near Chattanooga. The removal began in earnest. The suffering that they endured in the forts and camps was only a taste of what was to come. It wasn't just some short trip. In some cases, it was as far as, on foot, over 1,000 miles. Most of them walked with just the clothes on their backs to last the whole trip, some without even shoes or moccasins if they happened to not have any on when the soldiers with bayonets arrived. And since they lived in Georgia and the removal started in May, none of them had any winter clothes with them. When the fall and winter rains and snows came, most had just a blanket or two, perhaps provided by those leading them on the trek. Deaths happened almost daily, particularly in southern Illinois, where some groups had to wait in miserable conditions for days or weeks to cross the ice-blocked Mississippi. At one point, two-thirds of the Cherokee were trapped during January between the ice-bound Ohio and Mississippi rivers. Estimates indicate somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 died along the way. A traveler from Maine described what he saw in Kentucky when passing by a caravan of Cherokee. We found the road literally filled with the procession for about three miles in length. The sick and feeble were carried in wagons. A great many ride horseback and multitudes go on foot. Even aged females, apparently nearly ready to drop into the grave, were traveling with heavy burdens attached to the back on the sometimes frozen ground and sometimes muddy streets with no covering for the feet except what nature had given them. The Wikipedia Trail of Tears article adds a few details of the travails along the trail. Because of the diseases like measles and smallpox that plagued them, the Indians were not allowed to go into any towns or villages along the way. Many times this meant traveling much farther to go around them. After crossing Tennessee and Kentucky, they arrived in southern Illinois about the 3rd of December, 1838. Here, the starving Indians were charged a dollar a head to cross the river on Berry's Ferry, which typically charged 12 cents a head. They were not allowed passage until the ferry had served all others wishing to cross and were forced to take shelter under Mantle Rock, a shelter bluff on the Kentucky side, until Barry had nothing better to do. Many died huddled together at Mantle Rock, waiting to cross. But at least the surviving Cherokee as a group got $5 million to get a fresh start when they got to Oklahoma, right? Well, not exactly. The money didn't go to any Cherokee individually, and none got any reparations for what they left back in their homeland. So it wasn't like modern times when at least some individual people after a big disaster like Hurricane Katrina, get financial help to rebuild their homes and businesses and lives. The money just went to setting up public works like flour mills. And it wasn't quite $5 million. When a financial settlement was finally made, the federal government deducted over $1.2 million from the $5 million for costs related to the removal. History now labels this whole episode as the Trail of Tears. But back at the time, the United States Commissioner of Indian Affairs had a different description of it that he included in his final report. Good feeling has been preserved, and we have quietly and gently transported 18,000 friends to the west bank of the Mississippi. Quietly and gently, good feelings, those are the words the commissioner used to describe the episode. A Georgia military volunteer, afterwards a colonel in the Confederate service, who was involved in rounding up the Cherokee, put it in much different words. I fought through the Civil War. It has been my experience to see men shot to pieces and slaughtered by thousands. But the Cherokee's removal was the cruelest work I ever saw.